Hi guys, how's it going? I haven't shown you this bike for quite some time. It's my Levo SL and I've got quite a few mods on it. And a lot of you have been messaging me because you're quite curious as to what I've done with the, the setup, the travel, um, the, removing the controller as well. So I'll take you through it in a bit more detail, show you all the parts. And honestly, this is an absolute ripper. It weighs 17.25 kilograms set up like this. And I can actually get it to about 16 and a half by taking out the main battery and just running on the extender, which is pretty incredible. 16 and a half kilos for a 160 mil travel bike. So I'll show you in a bit more detail around the bike and uh, show you all the parts and all the bits that I've put on it. And if you've got any questions, pop them down below, but let's have a look. So firstly, one of the biggest upgrades was changing that fork out from the standard Fox 34 to this Olin's RXF 36 M2 and 160. I was a bit worried that putting a 160 travel fork on this might make it a little bit too slack and a bit difficult to climb because the chain today is so short. This is crazy slack now. I measured it and it comes in at 64.6 degrees and that's with a proper instrument and I rotated the bike round to double check it was the same. Averaged the two readings to make sure that head angle was bang on and it's 64.6 degrees, which is pretty slack, you know, for this type of bike, but it makes it handle superb on the down stuff and I had to move the seat pretty far forward on the rails to make sure when I'm climbing up the steeper bits my weight is as far forward as I can possibly get but check this fork out Olin's RXF 36 M2 and it is 160 travel standard like 51 offset and um, it's slackened it out a nice amount it's really stiff but what I like about it is the way you set it up. I love the fact how customizable it is. Now, normally you'll use tokens to set ramp up speed in a fork or progression, should I say. Um, and you might use more tokens to get a really nice plush feeling off the top, but then to stop it bottoming out, you effectively reduce the volume of the fork by using air tokens. Whereas this fork, the unique thing about it is it has a third ramp up chamber. Now, uh, as I mentioned, I've done a separate video on this fork, but you can have it really, really nice and supple off the top to get rid of all that trail kind of chatter, um, make it really nice and comfortable, but really progressive on the big hits using that ramp up chamber. It, you effectively put extra air in it and it makes it really kind of progressive right at the end of the stroke. So when you're kind of hitting some bigger, chunkier stuff, it doesn't bottom out at all. Um, it feels really stiff. It's 36 mil in stanchion width instead of the Fox 34 that it came with, but it looks absolutely stunning with that nice yellow uh, contrast, yellow and black, and then those Maxxis DHR tires on the front. So that's the fork. And I've also got the Olin's TTX air shock on the rear. There we go. Now, obviously it's in a different league to the stock Fox shock, the Fox um, DPS shock that came on it. Uh, and it's quite a bit more expensive, but the biggest difference I've noticed is in the mid stroke. Now it is super supple and super sensitive. And to be totally fair, I've not had it on long. So I've not ridden anything super gnarly just yet. Um, but it's got, you know, little tiny little piggyback reservoir on it as well. And um, the classic kind of Olin's uh, design and valve in from their TTX series of shocks. So no doubt this is going to be an outstanding performer. But the biggest thing just from riding my regular kind of trails around here uh, is that that small bump sensitivity and that mid stroke sensitivity. It feels sublime and obviously it's got decent amount of adjustment, high speed compression, low speed compression and rebound adjustment on there as well. Um, interestingly, point to note, just mounts the other way around. So the air can sits at the bottom and then the um, adjusters sit at the top. It doesn't really make much difference, but I had to double check I was putting it on the right way when I installed it. Super easy to install a rear shock. You literally just unbolt top bolt and then the bottom bolt and then uh, this one up here this one down here, and then you've got a shock just slots straight in. It's, it couldn't be more straightforward. Looking super sweet. Nice blue SKF wiper seals. 
all the suspension companies are making a big deal that they use SKF wiper seals. Um, so must be good. Next up, the DT Swiss HXC 1200 rims. These are carbon wheels, carbon rims, and they are built for big hits and big kind of enduro style riding. And they weigh about 1.7 kilos for the wheel set. So it's not the super, super light style of carbon rims that you can get, but they are proper burly. And last week I had the biggest stack I've had in a long time. Not on this bike, but another bike that had these exact same rims. I cased a jump massively and I pretty much knocked myself out and I lost all my memory for the day. It was really scary. And um, I was actually quite worried about the rims, but there's not a single mark on them. So HXC 1200 rims from DT Swiss. Now, I am not gonna lie, I'm super lucky that I've been able to get these kind of components to test from the company. So um, it's not lost on me how expensive this stuff is. It is just super good. And that's why I wanted to share with you um, some of the changes that I've made. In terms of tires, I'm using the DHR2 on the front in 2.4 in Max Terra, weighs about one kilo. And for my riding, which is more trail stuff in the south of the UK, Surrey Hills kind of stuff, they seem absolutely fine. They are not the stiffest in terms of the sidewall, um, but you know, this bike's pretty light. I'm not riding massively rocky terrain. And I like the DHR2 on the front. I find that the brake-in traction that you get, the brake-in grip, um, is phenomenal. So I really like that tire. In 2.4, I don't think I need anything bigger. I like the responsiveness that you get from it. And just on the back, just for the summer, I'm using the Minion SS, semi-slick. Weighs about 800 and something grams. So it's a little bit lighter, but it's got the same kind of side knobs as you get on the DHF and DHR. It's just the center tread is great for rolling speed. It's great for pedaling above the limit. And I do recommend you give this a go if you're on kind of dry summer style hard pack trails. You don't need a huge amount of rear wheel grip. It's actually quite fun to slide around. And because you've got those big kind of chunky side knobs, it performs on the edge very similar to the DHF and DHR. And they're pretty cheap. This was about 30 pounds this one cost me. So it's a good kind of summer dry trail. I won't be using it as soon as the kind of rain kicks in because it will just be slipping and sliding all over the place and won't give me enough climbing grip, but it's a good fun tire. I've enjoyed using this one. The S-Works carbon bar that I uh, bought from Specialized. I uh, just wanted to see if I could get this super light build. And um, it looks to me, it's the DH bar, but I think it's almost the same kind of profile the same rise and back sweep as the standard bar let me know what you think but i couldn't tell any difference and they advertised it as like a 38 mil rise i don't know maybe they sent me the wrong one sram axis wireless shift in which um honestly works fantastically well it is a lot of money um is it worth it a few people have asked me this i I don't think it's worth it in terms of the money because it is a lot of money to upgrade. But I've got to be honest, the performance is fantastic. If it was a bit cheaper, for sure, I, I, would, I do recommend it to everybody because I think it works superb. But I just think it's, it's still quite an expensive upgrade. And I think it's one of those kind of um, upgrades that you know, it's, it's not gonna give you a huge amount of performance on your bike. It just feels like super luxury to shift. And if I turn around here, I've got the wireless dropper as well. By the way, a lot of this stuff that I bought, I did actually buy myself. Um, it just looks super clean, doesn't it? If you look at that, that angle there, it's crazy clean, isn't it? Just literally, we're just waiting for wireless brakes now. And, um, then it's, you know, super clean cockpit. But yeah, that looks well cool. Happy with that. By the way, if you can hear guns and all that kind of stuff, I'm just in one of the army training ranges right now and uh, you're allowed here, it's public access, but 
That's why there's gunshots going off in the background. I swapped out the brakes to the code, the SRAM code, the stock guide REs. I don't know, they just didn't feel like they had the power that I was looking for um, compared to the code and I had these spare. And I do prefer the code, uh, the feel of the code. The caliper has got a different caliper design on it. It's a bit more powerful, quite a lot more powerful actually. So the codes, work super well on this. I have found with codes that I do need to keep bleeding them like every few months and the pad wears down quite quickly. But as long as you keep on top of the maintenance, they're a really good break. Here we go, RockShox Reverb Dropper. Argon grips with that nice oil slick kind of design. Looks super cool. And I actually put a slightly longer stem on this by five mil because I do find the reach Fairly short for my size. It's like 480 mil reach this bike and it's on the shorter side. For me, I'm 191 centimeters, six foot three. Um, and I put like a, I think the standard's like 45 and that's like a 50, 50 mil stem. So uh, just a little bit, little bit more reach. I could play around with the stem height as well, raise the bars a little bit uh, or lower the bars a little bit, should I say. And then you've got classic specialized, the little SWAT tool just in there, which um, super handy. You can actually, I've seen some people take that out and take the whole kind of holding mechanism out and it saves another, if you really want to get proper weight weenie, it saves like another 200 grams off the total weight of the bike. But um, this is way too handy for me not to have. It's just, just simple little things like changing your bars around, changing your, um, you know, straightening up your bars, your saddle, all that kind of stuff. It's just super handy. So yeah, but I've seen a, a few people remove that to save a couple of hundred grams. Not for me. All right, what else have we got? Yeah, so just the stock specialized saddle that it came with. Um, bridge, I think it's called. And then the SRAM, you can see the little SRAM wireless uh, battery holder. There's a couple of times actually where I've run out of battery, once on the saddle and once on the gears, once on the rear mech, and it is a little bit frustrating. It's pretty much user error because it does, it does tell you through your phone, if you paired it up, uh, it'll tell you that it's running out of battery, but I always forget, and there's been a couple of times. You can swap out the battery from the um, rear mech, it's the same battery for the saddle, for the dropper, so you can just swap them around if one of them fails, or one of them runs out, should I say, not fails. And I know that's massively moaning because it's a massive luxury to have um, wireless dropper and wireless gears. So I'll just shut up about that. And the cassette is the Eagle, um, not the brand new Eagle, not the 52, just the 10 to 50, which I think, honestly, I don't think that I climb steep enough inclines to need the 52. It's, it works perfectly well for me. And just the stock chain ring, stock Praxis cranks. Praxis now sell the carbon ones aftermarket. You can buy those. Um, I just got the regular alloy ones. And the classic Crank Brothers mallet pedals, the mallet E pedals. So if I just move around here a little bit, you see mine are the long spindle version. I just prefer to be a little bit further away from the cranks. Um, I don't know what the difference is, maybe five mil difference in terms of width from the end of the crank to the pedal, uh, the spindle length, but I like these LS versions. They work super well. It does look so slick, doesn't it? Super slick and I love the black carbon, the yellow of the Maxxis tires and the Olin's fork. I just think it sets it off really nice. It's a brilliant bike. Okay, a couple of things. The motor is definitely noisier on this than the standard Levo. The Levo, standard Levo is belt driven. This has got uh, smaller plastic gears in. It's got a higher pitch whine. It's not massively distracting, but it is there and I can notice it. It is definitely noisier. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, I took off the mode controller. So normally when you get a bike, uh, specialized turbo bike, you've got a mode controller on here. Um, I took it off because I don't actually find you need it. You can fine tune mission control to give you up to 100% assistance depending on the amount of pedal 
power you're putting through, depending on the pressure you're putting through the pedals. So it's almost like a full auto mode. So I've got it on 35% um, uh, support and then 100%, I think it's like max motor power. So effectively, um, when I'm just cruising along, it's given me 35% support, but when I need it and I'm putting pressure down enough on the pedals, it's pumping out up to 100% support. So it's giving me the full 240 watts from the motor. Uh, that works really well. And in situations that I've really needed just 100%, 100%, you can just reach down on here and you can just press this button on here um, to cycle through the power. I'll show you. There we go. Just cycle through there. So um, eco, trail, turbo, hold it down and you can turn it off. So I just leave it in that middle mode, that trail mode. It's pretty much full auto. It's given me up to 100% assistance when I put enough power through the pedals. It just looks super clean at the front with those wireless shifter axis um, shifter and RockShox wireless dropper. Now I've done a couple of rides where I've tested the battery and I've done one on video that you can go and watch. But if you don't want to watch it, I got 60 kilometers out of the 320 watt internal battery. I thought that was really good. Um, it wasn't a huge amount of climbing and climbing will affect the battery life quite considerably. But 60 kilometers with a 320 watt internal battery is pretty remarkable uh, and I've got the range extender as well so when I go out and ride with other bikes that have got like full fat other bikers that have got full fat e-bikes I often just leave it in turbo because turbo is not quite as much as trail on a full fat but I find that if I put in a little bit more effort I can definitely keep up in the kind of Surrey Hills south of the UK area if it was a super steep climb, you know, we're talking a um, thousand foot of elevation, a big climb or something super gnarly and super rocky, I definitely wouldn't be able to keep up um, if they were in turbo and charging up there. But I found that with this in turbo, I can keep up with a regular rider on a full fat e-bike fairly well. In fact, that was one of my biggest concerns when I got this bike. It was, would I be able to ride with regular full fat bikers uh, on this bike here? Because obviously, if you look at it on paper, it's less power um, and less battery. So you would think that you might not be able to, but you definitely can. So there you go, Levo SL. Um, like, super expensive i'm not gonna lie it's like the bike's expensive all the parts on it are expensive but kind of gives you an idea of what e-bikes can be um 17.25 kilos for a 160 mil travel kind of enduro style build e-bike is pretty awesome massive thanks to all the companies that have helped me kind of build this and put this together and test the parts because without those guys um, i wouldn't have been able to uh, have this kind of set up um, and it is honestly it's a brilliant bike it's the one that I choose when I'm riding just around here and around uh, local trails and all that kind of stuff and with mates it's the bike that is my kind of go-to bike at the moment I like it that much I think it's fantastic um, you probably think I would say that because it's got loads of cool stuff on but it just feels like a different experience to a regular full fat e-bike don't get me wrong, still love the full fat e-bikes as well. Uh, but this is just a little bit different and maybe a glimpse into a different category of e-bike that we'll see from other manufacturers. I'm sure that we're gonna see, you know, even more lightweight e-bikes. We've already got the EZSD. This one, no doubt we'll see more coming out really soon um, to kind of complement or have another one in the range for the brands because, you know, the full fat market it's pretty saturated now, isn't it? A couple of years ago, there was only, I don't know, five or six really. And now it's like every brand, not every brand, but most brands have got a full fat e-bike. Um, and these lightweight ones are still kind of in their infancy. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. By the way, if you're interested in riding it without the main battery and just an extender, I've done a video on that as well. I'll link that down in the description. And you can, like I said, you can save another 800 grams if you're really searching for the weight. Um, it's not really worth it in the grand scheme of things. It doesn't feel 
massively different, but I was just curious to see what it was like riding it without the main battery, but it is possible. And actually, if you're flying, you can just take the range extenders in your hand luggage, which is pretty cool. You can take two uh, range extenders with most airlines because they're only 160 watt hours in hand luggage and put your bike in the hold, which you cannot do with many e-bikes. Um, in fact, almost all airlines restrict e-bikes completely because of the battery size. Let me know if you've got any questions about the bike or the build or anything else, I'm happy to answer where I can. If you like the video, let me know with a thumbs up because it helps me understand what you guys like. Um, and I bring weekly e-bike content, so subscribe if you want to see more and I'll catch up with you all soon.